Carbon fiber is a wonderful material that has found applications in many different industries. But is it a good choice for deep sea vessels like Titan? Finding the correct material for a given application is a core part of engineering. Certain physical properties of materials, three in particular, are of fundamental importance in design. Strength, stiffness, and toughness. Despite its wonderful properties like stiffness and strength per weight, carbon fiber is like glass in toughness and a challenging material to work with. On top of that, composite fatigue is hard to predict and evaluate, whereas metal fatigue is very well understood. This is because failures in composites are caused by microscopic defects that are never the same for different samples. So the conditions for failure are very variable unless manufacturing processes are tightly controlled. Carbon fibers on their own cannot be used as a useful material and have to be bound by a plastic resin to give the material its shape. As this plastic is weaker than the fibers, the strength of the material is in the direction along the fibers. In the other direction, there is no run of fibers to resist the force and resin matrix gets pulled apart and breaks. To combat this, engineers layer the fabrics on top of each other in different directions until similar stiffness is achieved in all directions. This also has its limits though because doing this adds weight to the material taking away any advantages gained. As it is only the resin matrix holding these layers together, if that fails, we get delamination of the layers. Manufacturing this material is also a problem, and it needs to be placed in an autoclave which applies pressure and heat to get the best quality material. During the curing process, this forces the air and other voids that can weaken the material out of the resin and after manufacturing, parts are often scanned with ultrasound technology to check that the resin has cured with a tolerable amount of microvoids. For a submersible's pressure hull, such microvoids can quickly become cracks, causing delamination and snap buckling, causing an implosion. So coming up with a manufacturable design that would have no delaminations or voids and would be consistent is a hard problem. And OceanGate used a company called Spencer Composites, and they picked up a layup strategy that combined alternating placement of pre-preg carbon fiber and epoxy unidirectional fabrics in the axial direction and with wet winding of carbon fiber and epoxy in the hoop direction for a total of 480 plies. That is 127 millimeters thick or five inches thick. An initial assessment of the cured cylinder showed that it had a porosity of less than 1%. But was it enough? The best way to do this process with the minimum microvoids in the structure would be to use pre-preg carbon layers and then cure them in an autoclave. So these guys did one layer of pre-preg carbon and then another one with wet binding and they didn't use an autoclave. Perhaps it was just to save money on the manufacturing costs. Under tremendous pressure changes and over repeated dives, could this have caused the hull to fail under the pressure of water at that depth? With rigorous testing and maintenance schedules, such flaws could have been picked up earlier and they could have been resolved. The aircraft manufacturers do this despite facing orders of magnitude less pressure difference and using the carbon fiber properties to their advantage where they're withholding pressure on the inside. Compression is not really suited to carbon fiber composites as the tensile strength never comes into play and resin matrix properties govern the strength of the material. Imagine a closed piece of string. If you push it outwards, it resists that force. But Pressing it inwards causes it to buckle and a, since a submarine's hull is always in compression as the water surrounding it puts pressure on it from all sides, it's clear to see that the strength of the material is not suited to this particular application. Now Ocean Gate broke many rules of deep sea vessel traditional design like using a sphere and using homogeneous and contiguous materials like titanium or stainless steel. Metallic pressure hulls, however, because they are not buoyant in designs for depths of more than 2,000 meters, present challenges when it comes to managing ballast for ascent and descent, require the use of syntactic foam attached to the outside of the craft to achieve neutral buoyancy. This quickly adds to the cost of the submersible, whereas using carbon fiber allows us to create a pressure hull that is naturally buoyant. In engineering, managing risk starts with eliminating it altogether if possible 
and having natural buoyancy does reduce that risk of getting stuck at the bottom of the ocean in case things have gone horribly wrong. But it shouldn't come at the cost of adding other bigger risks. Leading figures in the industry warned them not to use carbon fiber, and one engineer pointed out the flaws with the sub's hull as far back as 2018, only to get sued. This University of Washington's Applied Physics Lab video shows a one-third scale test of Titan's carbon fiber hull. In this early design, the hemispheres at each end were also made of carbon fiber, and at a depth of 3,000 meters, one of these let water in. When Titan imploded, its carbon fiber hull and unusual shape carried over from this early design, with the end caps getting replaced by titanium. Now, OceanGate affixed the two materials using epoxy, and there was probably no other way to get it done. But this brings a new set of challenges and a new point of failure. The epoxy holding the carbon fiber to the titanium would have been put under two different kinds of cyclical stress from the two different materials undergoing pressure and temperature changes. The contraction and expansion of these materials at different rates as the sub went down and came back up could certainly degrade the adhesive bond with used. It is likely that the epoxy layer failed as the carbon fiber compressed more than the titanium. After a few cycles, it could have compromised the epoxy at a micro level, eventually growing into macro deformation and fracturing, and that would have sheared the end cap off. During the second dive of the sub, one friend of Stockton Rush was in the submersible with him and the pressure hull kept creaking as they descended down to the depths of the ocean. And it kept creaking even when they ascended and went close to 300 meters to the surface, which indicated that the carbon fibers were breaking and delamination was happening. Now for something as critical as a pressure hull of the submarine, they really should have done some non-destructive testing and they really should have analyzed the design well beforehand and rated it much higher than the depth they were planning to go. And then once the first hull was completed, they should have subjected that, and possibly a few more, to destructive testing, testing them repeatedly so they understood and really nailed down the manufacturing process and could guarantee that, okay, this is how many dives one pressure hull would last us. Given the application, they should have never used carbon fiber. We don't know much about this material, it, we, it's still relatively new to us and for an application like this we really need to test and research a lot more. So they might have thought that finding ways to work with the wrong material is an engineering challenge but in reality it's just bad engineering.